Good morning everybody, my name is Alex and as I'm sure you're aware by now if you've been following this channel for any length of time, uh, I'm a pretty strong proponent for the theory of evolution by natural selection and I certainly don't think that anybody should be restricted of learning of its explanation for the origin of species. However, as I'm sure you're also aware, not everybody agrees with this opinion and there's a prominent organisation within the creationist movement called Answers in Genesis uh, which recently put out a list of 12 arguments that they think evolutionists should avoid using. Uh, so I thought that we'd take a look through it and see if it holds any merit. And of course, a link to the original article will be in the description down below if you want to go and check it out for yourself, but I'm going to try not to leave anything out here and now. Argument 1. Evolution is a fact. When our core beliefs are attacked, it's often easy for humans to retreat to such statements as this. My belief is a fact, and yours is wrong. That's exactly why we cannot trust mere human understanding to explain the unobservable past. Emotion and pride get in the way. Evolution is not a fact, no matter how many times evolutionists say it is. It's a framework built on assumptions about the past, assumptions that will never have direct, first-hand, observational proof. Now I've said this before, but just because you can't directly observe an occurrence doesn't mean that you can't directly observe evidence for that occurrence. Take the following example. Imagine you're in the middle of a desert, and stood in the wilderness is a single tree and on the floor is a leaf, the same colour as all the leaves on the tree. Now, you didn't see that leaf fall off the tree, but you can assume that that's what's happened based on the evidence that you do have available to you. Now, this is inductive reasoning, but inductive reasoning can be trusted uh, when it's strong enough. This is how detective work is done. Also, of course, it goes without saying that nobody was around to observe the creation myth propagated by Answers in Genesis either. And look, evolution, like any other fact of nature, is a scientific fact, meaning that it's based upon inductive reasoning uh, and is falsifiable. It's just that the likelihood of it being falsified is minuscule. For instance, if I were to take this book uh, and hold it here, I'm pretty sure that if I let go this is going to fall to the ground. Now I can't be certain of this because of course I can't see the future, but based on inductive reasoning and things that I've seen in the past, I can assume that it's going to happen again. And that's science. Argument 2. Only the uneducated reject evolution. Besides the arrogance of such statements, this argument has no footing and should be cast off. Mainly, those who make this claim usually define educated people as those who accept evolution. Anyone who disagrees fails the test, no matter what their background. E.g., if we follow this ideology, Isaac Newton must have been uneducated. The problem with the logic being presented here is that Education is usually focused, meaning you can be incredibly intelligent and incredibly educated, uh, just not specifically, say, in evolutionary biology. For instance, I could meet someone who's incredibly well-read in poetry and say, well, what do you think about evolution? And they might say, well, I don't really know, I don't believe in it, I haven't seen the evidence. And that makes perfect sense. You have no reason to know about these things, uh, and so it makes sense for you to be on the fence. That doesn't mean you're uneducated, it just means you're uneducated in evolution. Uh, and in fact, I'd say it's less accurate to say that it's those who disbelieve in evolution that are uneducated, but rather that people who are educated in evolution almost unanimously believe in it. And furthermore, when you do find that rare combination of people who both do have some kind of education in evolutionary biology, but still deny it, uh, they almost always share something in common, and this is invariably some kind of religious presupposition. Also, I simply must pick you up on your Isaac Newton example. Um, Isaac Newton died in 1727, which is over a hundred years before Charles Darwin published The Origin of Species. He would have absolutely no reason to know anything about evolution by natural selection. Okay, we judge people's intelligence by the standards of the time. Imagine I were to say, oh, Albert Einstein was so stupid, he couldn't even name who the 42nd President of the United States was. Well, of course he couldn't, because Albert Einstein died when Bill Clinton was eight years old. This is a complete red herring. Argument 3. Overwhelming evidence in all fields of science supports evolution. The irony, of course, is that for centuries prior to Darwin's publication of On the Origin of Species, the majority of scientists found the opposite to be true. The evidence supported creation. What changed? Not the evidence. Rather, the starting point changed, i.e. moving from the Bible, God's word, to humanism, man's word. Oh, so what you're saying is that people adapted their worldview based on evidence which contradicted their pre-existing beliefs. Ugh, how irrational. Look, I used to believe in the existence of Father Christmas, or Santa Claus, and the evidence was right there, there were presents under the tree. But I, you know, grew out of that. In science, new evidence always supersedes old ideas if the two are contradictory. And I would love to see some overwhelming evidence to support your worldview that doesn't rely on the Bible. Show me that and then maybe you may have a point. Argument 4. Doubting evolution is like doubting gravity. Why does this argument fail? We'll show you. Take a pencil or a pen, hold it in the air, then drop it to the floor. 
that's gravity. Next, make a single-celled organism, like an amoeba, and turn it into a goat. Go ahead, we'll wait. No? As you can see, there's a fundamental difference between operational science, which can be tested through repeatable experimentation, and historical science, which cannot. Okay, a few things here. Firstly, evolution is not historical science, okay? It's not something that happened in the past and that we are the product of. Uh, it's still happening today, we're just one step along the evolutionary timeline. Secondly, this is another red herring. Uh, I do often hear this comparison between evolution and gravity, but almost always brought up in the context of the word theory. People criticise evolution for being only a theory, uh, people respond to that simply by saying, well, so is gravity. And that's the context in which the two are compared. And thirdly, if you'll allow me once again to reach for Thomas Jefferson, author of America, um, we've already demonstrated that if I let go of this book, it's going to fall to the floor. But why? How do you know that that's because of gravity? I mean, can you observe gravity itself? No, you can only observe the result of gravity. You can only observe the evidence that exists in favour of the hypothesis that there is a force called gravity. Um, you can't observe it directly, so why do you believe in it? I'll tell you why. It's because you don't need to observe something directly to believe in it. All you need to do is observe evidence in favour of its existence, and that's what we have for evolution. Argument 5. Doubting evolution is like believing the Earth is flat. Ironically, the Bible describes the Earth as round and hanging in space, long before this could have been directly observed. Okay, this always gets me. Uh, the, the quote that you're using from the Bible to support the claim that the Earth is a globe is Isaiah 40.22, which states, um, It is he who sits above the circle of the Earth. Now, if I was somebody who wanted to prove that the Bible was scientifically accurate, I would avoid this verse at all costs. Think about it for a second. The circle of the Earth. If I were to ask you what shape a basketball is, what would you say? Certainly not circular. You'd say it was spherical. You'd say it was globular. Okay, and in fact, you know what can be described as circular? The flat earth model. Your point is null. But even if it were true that people once universally believed in a flat earth, direct repeatable observation shows us that the earth is round and orbiting the sun. Evolutionary stories about fossils are not direct observations, they're assumption-based beliefs. Wait, now hang on a second, what are you talking about direct observable evidence? Have you ever been to space? I don't think so, which means that you're relying on indirect evidence to prove that the Earth is globular. Maybe ships disappearing bottom first over the horizon, or the shadow of the Earth on the moon during a lunar eclipse. These are all indirect, and your main criticism of evolution seems to be that it's unobservable. Uh, but you're contradicting yourself again and again, because it seems that so are many of your beliefs, so you're really kind of shooting yourself in the foot here. Argument 6. It's here, so it must have evolved. A conclusion does not always prove the premises are true. That is, if the answer is 4, we could arrive at that any number of ways. 2 plus 2, 5 minus 1, etc. In the same way, evolutionists often assume that since certain species or traits exist, this is proof of evolution because it's how it must have happened. This argument, however, is self-reflexive, and useless. The Bible offers another, and more sound, framework for how these traits and species came to be. Evolution does not imply that there's one way that things must have evolved. In fact, evolution implies the exact antithesis of this, that there was a whole manner of ways, an incalculable number of ways, that life could have evolved, uh, and we're just having a great time figuring out exactly how that happened. It's you that's saying that there must be one way that things must have come to be on this planet, and you're basing that upon the Bible, uh, which completely contradicts this many paths idea. Again, this shows your complete lack of understanding of evolutionary biology, uh, and again, you're just contradicting yourself. Argument 7. Natural selection is evolution. This is likely the most absurd argument on the list, and most in need of being scrapped. Often, evolutionists bait people into showing them a change that is merely natural selection, and then switch to say that this proves molecules to man evolution. However, this is quite misleading. Natural selection, even according to evolutionists, does not have the power to generate anything new. The observable process can only act upon existing characteristics so that some members of a species are more likely to survive. In fact, it's an important component of the biblical worldview. Well, no, natural selection is not the same thing as evolution, but natural selection is the process by which evolution takes place. If you take natural selection and extend it over a long enough period of time, then logically, evolution will be the result. In another article from Answers in Genesis, they claim that God created animals with genetic variability to be able to survive the changes in nature which God also controls. And my question would simply be, why would God create animals with genetic variability, allowing them to adapt when their environments become too hostile for their existence? Why would he not just create them fit to survive those environments in the first place, or retain the climate entirely? Also, natural selection works on the basis of survival of the fittest, that is, death of the unsuitable. 
Now, if God did create animals with genetic variability purposefully to allow them to survive, then why don't all members of a species benefit from this? By what standard is God deciding who lives and who dies? Is it not slightly more plausible uh, that genetic mutational variability is due to some kind of random biological fact of nature rather than being divinely inspired? I'll leave that with you. Argument 8. Common design means common ancestry. Historical common descent is not and cannot be confirmed through observation. Rather, certain observations are explained by assumptions about the past. These observations, we might add, have alternative explanations. Common body parts, for example, do not prove common descent. That's an assumption. A common designer fits the evidence just as well, if not better. Okay, firstly, stop using the word design in that context. By using the word design to describe all animals that exist is a kind of subtle circular reasoning, because that's the very thing that you're trying to prove. But that aside, uh, common characteristics were the inspiration behind evolution, not the proof. Okay, when Charles Darwin noticed that there were some kind of visual similarities between animals, he didn't say, aha, see, evolution is true. That was just the inspiration that made him think, well, maybe there is something more to it. And if you ask an evolutionary biologist today, um, not one of them will ever say that their reason to believe in evolution is because some animals look alike. Again, a complete straw man, not an argument that anybody ever uses. Argument 9. Sedimentary layers show millions of years of geological activity. Sedimentary layers show one thing. Sedimentary layers. In other words, we can and should study the rocks, but the claim that rocks prove that the Earth must be billions of years old ignores one important point. Such an interpretation is built upon a stack of assumptions. When we start with the Bible... Okay, hang on a second, I've just got to jump in there. So you're claiming that independent, peer-reviewed studies and investigations which all point to the same conclusion regardless of the fact that the researchers didn't communicate with each other are a stack of assumptions before imploring us to base our beliefs on the Bible, an actual stack of assumptions. When we start with the Bible and examine the rocks within the framework of a global flood, the need for long ages vanishes. But what you're failing to do is to provide any kind of evidence for such a global flood. Okay, until you do so, your argument will hold no weight. In fact, there's actually evidence to the contrary of a global flood at the time at which creationists claim that there was one. For instance, other people in other areas of the world didn't seem to notice that their villages and all of their friends and family had been destroyed by an unstoppable flow of water when they continued to live and write during that time period. Argument 10. Mutations drive evolution. Perhaps because of movies and fiction, the popular idea is that mutations make evolution go. Or perhaps it's because of independent, peer-reviewed studies and investigations which all point to the same conclusion regardless of the fact that the researchers... You get the idea. Given enough time, shifts in the genetic code will produce all the variety of plants and animals on Earth and beyond. The problem? Mutations cannot produce the types of changes that evolution requires. Not even close. Well, there we have it, ladies and gentlemen, undeniable proof. Note the wealth of evidence and reliable examples presented here to support Answers in Genesis's case. Namely, it's impossible. Some may benefit an organism, e.g. beetles on a windy island losing their wings, but virtually every time mutations come with a cost. You are quite literally describing the process of evolution. Some mutations are good, some mutations are bad, most mutations have absolutely no effect whatsoever, but given enough time, you'll start to see changes within a species in relation to their environment. Now all you've got to do is add in some kind of geographical isolation of two or more groups, and you're on your way. Argument 11. The Scopes Trial. Misconceptions about the Scopes Trial run rampant. Often, accounts sound something like this. Fundamentalist Christian bigots arrested an innocent biology teacher fighting for scientific freedom, and while they won the court case, they ultimately lost the public perception battle to the well-reasoned presentation of the defence. Thanks to the play Inherit the Wind, this common, though completely flawed, perception of the event continues to be used against creationists. But real history presents a much different account. Again, there seems to be a noticeable lack of supporting evidence here, but even if that wasn't the case, the Scopes trial has absolutely nothing to do with the scientific legitimacy of evolution. You will never see a biologist attempt to use the persecution of people who believe in evolution as evidence of its truth. Basing arguments on emotion rather than reason is not a trademark of science, but of faith. Look, imagine I were to flip the script here and say, you know, Christians often complain that they're persecuted in education and politics, but this clearly isn't the case. They're not persecuted at all. Therefore, God does not exist. It just makes absolutely no sense, and again, is a complete red herring. Argument 12, and congratulations to you all for sticking through to the end of this, don't worry, we're nearly there. 
Science versus Religion News stories thrive on conflict and intrigue, and one common theme presents science and religion as opposing forces, reason struggling to overcome the draconian divine revelation. It grabs attention, but it's bunk. Many atheists and humanists oppose biblical Christianity, but science does not. Well, yes it does, but that's besides the point. Science doesn't disprove religion, just certain claims of certain religions, one being that every single living thing had a sudden distinct origin uh, less than a few thousand years ago. Okay, and it's not just atheists and humanists who reject this worldview. Uh, millions of Christians realise that Genesis is not a literal account, even if it was originally written with that intention. Okay, evolution happened. Evolution is still happening, and if you want to make some case against it without an appeal to biblical authority, then I'd be willing to give it some consideration. But first you have to drop the theology. Then you'll have my ear. Now before I go, I just want to say congratulations to Robert, who is this month's Patron of the Month, and as requested, Robert, you will be receiving a copy of God Is Not Great by Christopher Hitchens. Uh, and if you want to learn how to become a patron for yourself, of course, links are all in the description. But anyway, I have been Alex O'Connor, or Cosmic Skeptic. You can find me on social media here. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next one.